Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, and I welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace of God is uh, peace of God be upon each single one of you. That is the greeting that we Muslims, when we meet each other, we greet each other with, and that means peace be upon you. Now this was the same greeting that the prophets of the past, they used to greet each other and they used to greet their disciples with. For example, in the Gospel of John chapter number 20 verse number 19, when Jesus Christ, when he met his disciples in the upper chamber, as soon as he entered there, he told them, Assalamu alaikum, in Hebrew language, that means peace be upon you. So that is the greeting that we have for all of you. Now, we are very honored to have your class over here, and uh, I'm very glad that Professor uh, Johnson, he brought the class so we could learn from each other. We could share the wonderful things that the faith of Islam has to offer. In this day and age that we are living in, unfortunately, there is a fear of the unknown, especially of the faith of Islam. They have done survey after survey to find out which is the most misunderstood faith, and almost always, Islam took the number one place. Can you guys think of what was the faith that came in as number two? Which one? How about Hintis Mitt Romney? Mormon. Mormon faith, correct. So interactions of this nature are very, very important. So what we have for all of you would be, before we start the presentation, we want to ch check your Islamic IQ. <laughs> right? <laughs> just to make sure that you are listening to your professor and just the basics of Islam. Oh, we haven't done Islam yet. Oh, they have not. <laughs> okay. hey, but you have uh, all access to the internet, to the YouTube and Facebook, right? You may have been interacting with some of the Islamic themes. So, you have the very first question up there. The structure that you see up there, what is that? Be the mosque, correct? So, if we were praying, who wants to be a millionaire? That would be like a hundred dollar question, <laughs> right? The most basic of questions, and the answer is true. Jumping to $200 question here. All, Muslim, all Arabs are Muslims and most Muslims are Arabs. Yes. That's, that's false, correct? Because if you look at the Muslim population around the world, there are 1.6 billion Muslims and only a fraction of them, 18%, 19%, they belong to the Arab background. Now, I am a Muslim, I'm not from the Arab background. I have maybe about 15 Muslims in the back. Who's from the Arab background there, by the way? I think none of them, right? None of them. But there were a few of them praying upstairs who were from the Arab background. So if you look at the world population, the distribution of Muslims around the world, we see that Islam is there on all the continents and almost all the countries of the world. Who could name the most populous Muslim country in the world? Our non-Muslim guest, by the way. Indonesia. Indonesia, exactly. There are close to 200 million Muslims in Indonesia. More Muslims in Indonesia than many of the bigger Middle Eastern countries combined. In China, there are close to 100 million Muslims. In Russia, Europe, North America, South America, Australia. Right? So there are many, many Muslims all around the world. That helps. I don't have to project my voice in the back. Right? <laughs> These are some of the faces of Islam. You could see a Muslim who's a Caucasian, African American, a person from Australia, a person from Indonesia, a person from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, South America, Hispanic, Puerto Rican. So Islam is not a faith which is restricted to one country, one nationality. Islam is a universal faith. Anyone who proclaims that I believe that there is no God besides one God, Allah, and I believe that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. That is how a person embraces the faith of Islam. This is a very important question here. This is like the gist of the main presentation today. Islam was started by who? It's a tricky question, by the way. How many of you agree that A is the right answer? 
<laughs> Sorry, you guys are in minority. The right answer is D. Right? The right answer is D. And we will come back to it why that is the right answer. Right? Let's go to the next question here. Muslims worship who? D. D. D, right? Okay. That's the right answer. A friend of mine, a colleague in the hospital, I asked him the same question. And of all the answers, he picked that you Muslims, you worship Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> the holy book of Muslims is? B, the Quran. Wonderful, wonderful. So I think they passed the Islamic quiz test, right? What do you Muslims think? Right? They did. Wow, wonderful. Alright, let's come to Islam in the USA. They are close to 11 million Muslims in the USA and 400 of them, they reside in Chicago land area. 400 million, 400,000 uh, of them. There are close to 80 to 100 mosques in the Chicago land area, 25 full-time Islamic schools. So this mosque, it is attached to a full-time Islamic school. My son and daughter and some of the students who are here helping out uh, over here, they also are going to this full-time Islamic school, which is called as the MCC full-time Islamic school. So Muslims have been living here for many centuries actually, right? I mean, I don't have time to go into detail when Islam and came over here, but we have been living here for many, many decades and centuries. These are some of the prominent Muslims that uh, you will find. Some of them are on the media, in the sports, uh, politicians. So a quiz question again, and I have, I have three prizes over here by the way, right? I have three <laughs> wonderful books here. Can you identify our uh, guest over here, one of the two congressmen in there who are from the Muslim background. A hint would be they have an American flag, flag in the back. <laughs> All right? But can you name them, by the way? Can you name either one of those? Professor, that's the quiz for you. <laughs> Well, one is the, the congressman from Minnesota. Good, good. And who is the second one there? This is Keith Allison from Minnesota, right? Yeah. And this one here is Muslims in the back. Saleha, you know this. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an Indian, so I can ask you. All right, Andre Carson, right? So the, the reason I'm showing this slide is because Muslims are not just living here, they are contributing to better our wonderful land of America. In the field of sports and entertainment and uh, politics, uh, in the armed forces, all over the place. All right, let's go to the very important topic, obviously the topic of the today is, what is Islam? So the question which I had before, who started Islam? It was not started by any human being, not by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, not even by Abraham, peace be upon him. It was given by God to humanity as a guidance. So the name of God in Islam is Allah. So when we say the, way, the, the word Allah, we don't mean a different God, the God of the Muslims, the Middle East, or the God of the Middle East. We mean the same God who has created each single one of us. Just so in Arabic language, we call him as Allah. So a quiz question to you again would be, what was the name of God in the language of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him? What was his language and what was the name of God in that language? Our non-Muslim guest over here, by the way. A hint would be the Passion of the Christ. If you have seen that movie, they were mentioning that name over and over again. Elohim? No. Elohim, Yahweh, yes, in Hebrew language, correct. What was the language of Jesus Christ, by the way? Aramaic. Aramaic. And what, was, what is the name of God according to Encyclopedia, uh, according to Encyclopedia Britannica? Isa. The name of God in that language, yes? Isa. Isa, no. Isa is the name of Jesus Christ. The name of God in Aramaic language, the language of Jesus is Allah, Allah, Allah. For that reason, when they have translated the Bible into Arabic language, 
any time the word God occurs, they have written the word Allah. So look at this. This is Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. This is what it says. That in the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. So this is just to make the point that when you see the word God being referred by Muslims or in the media, we are not speaking about a different God, but the same God who created each single one of us. Now, God has many different attributes, right? Many different attributes. The, the number one attribute of God is that God is one. According to Islam, God is one, not one in three or any such combination. There is a chapter of the Quran, which is chapter number 112, that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was having an interaction with the Christian priests and pastors. During that interaction, the Christian priests and pastors, they asked Prophet Muhammad the question, peace be upon him, that, O oh Muhammad, what is the concept of God in your religion? At that time, that chapter was revealed, and then Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he mentioned that chapter to them. And I would uh, request uh, Amar to come up over here and recite Surah Ikhlas, chapter 112 for us, please. Amar, come on over. Good boy. <laughs> الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا احد Amar and Hudayfa, they are very special, right? I mean, everyone is special. The reason they are special in a very good positive way is they are in the process of memorizing the whole Quran. See the book over here? It's not a small book. Very soon, hopefully in the next few months, they will be memorizing the whole book from back to the front. So what Amar has just recited, he recited the chapter 112 of the Quran, and I will give you the translation. Say, He is Allah, the one and only. He is eternal, He is needed by all. He begets not, nor is begotten, and there is none like unto Him. So, the, the biggest concept in Islam about God is that He is one, that He is not multiple, that He is not a polytheistic creator. The second important concept of God in Islam is that He is the sole creator of the whole universe that no human being, not Muhammad peace be upon him, not Jesus, not any other prophet, or none of the creation took part in the creation of the whole universe. And this is a verse which is from chapter 2, verse number 255. It is called as the verse of the throne. So basically it says about the wonderful attributes of God, that Allah, there is no other God but He. He is everlasting, the ever living, the one who sustains and protects all that exists. Neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is, in the, uh, is on earth. And then the verse continues. So over there you see a very important attribute of God is that when he creates the creation, he doesn't get tired. He doesn't need to sleep. He doesn't get refreshed. So that is a very important attribute of God. When we Muslims worship God, when you saw us worshipping the creator of states, there was no crucifix in the front, there was no image in the front of anyone for that matter. We were praying to the unseen creator who is all knowing. We were bowing, bowing down to him and directly praying to him without any mediator. So we don't go through Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, nor of any saints or anybody else for that matter. Right, so that's a very important concept again. And the concept in Islam again is that God is eternal. Any being who is eternal doesn't have a beginning obviously by default. That means he does not have any parents. And we also say that he does not have any children, sons and daughters or any progeny for that matter. So we don't take Jesus Christ to be a son of God or part of the Trinity. So these are some of the other important attributes of God that He's all knowing, He's the sustainer. All of you are hungry, you are eating, God doesn't have to eat, He doesn't get tired, He doesn't get sleepy, right? 
then comes Divan and a buffet meal. Ah. <laughs> he is the taker of life and giver of death. Right? So he's the one who gave us life. And very important that he would be the master, he would be the main judge. He's the only judge on the day of judgment. Not Muhammad, peace be upon him, not any saints, not any friends and uh, you know professors over here, but only the creator would be the judge on the day of judgment. The reason is no matter how wonderful a human being is, he or she is not all-knowing. My mother cannot be my judge on the day of judgment because she cannot read my thoughts. She is not all-knowing. She is not monitoring me 24-7. I could be out, I could be doing something, and she may not know that. So the only entity who is all-knowing, all-powerful, would be the candidate for the day of judgment to be the master, to be the judge. And God alone fits that criteria. So in the Quran, there are 99 plus attributes of God. Right? We have uh, many wonderful literature up there. So after you are done from the presentation, you could take that literature and all of those are free by the way. So these are wonderful attributes of God. We don't have time to go over each one of them. We'll be here for all day, right? All right, but a very important attribute of God, my dear friends, is that Quran says that God is al wadud That means he is the source of all love. So a question to all of you would be, once you love someone, may that be your parents, some of you are married, may be your spouses, may be your grandparents, your cousins, siblings, anyone. If we love someone, don't we like to take care of that person or people? We do. In the same way, since God loves humanity and his creation, God would like to help his creation. God would like to guide his creation. So one of the attributes of God in the Quran is, he is al-hadi. That means he is the guide. Islam says that to guide humanity, God did not came down and became a human being or part of the creation. He remained God and he sent his guidance to special human beings who were called as prophets and messengers. So when God created the very first human being, Adam and his wife Eve, God did not leave them alone on their own human shortcomings and human fallible nature. So from the very beginning, God started to send guidance to Adam and Eve. And the crux of that guidance was, submit yourself to the one creator. Do not worship plants and trees, sun or the moon or any part of the creation. When God sent other prophets, Prophet Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, and thousands and thousands of other prophets, the same core belief was sent to all the prophets. Submit yourself to one God, submission to one God. So if you take that concept, submission to one God, and translates into Arabic language, one word in Arabic language means submission to one God. Can you guys guess what that one word would be? Our non-Muslim friends over here, by the way, right? Islam, correct, exactly. So that's what Islam means. I know many of you knew the answer. So that's what Islam means. So Muslims say, and the Quran says, that Islam was given to the very first human being, Adam, submission to one God. He preached Islam to his progeny. Noah, he preached Islam to his progeny. Moses and Jesus, they did not come according to the Quran with a new message or with a new scripture. Well, they came with a new scripture, but not with a new religion. They came with the same religion of Islam, means submission to the one creator. And I'll give you two examples. <clears throat> Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, when people asked him, what is the first and the biggest commandment? He said in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse number 4, that here, O Israel, the Lord of our God, He is one God. Prophet Jesus, peace be upon Him, He was asked exactly the same question. In the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse number 28, people asked Him and they asked Him the question. Of all the commandments, which one is the first commandment? And we know that from the Old, uh, from the Old Testament, the Jews, they had 613 commandments, laws. So Jesus Christ replied in Mark chapter 12, verse number 29, that here, O Israel, the Lord of our God, He is one God. 
Worship Him with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. And that is the first commandment. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he came, he was given the same commandment. Only one God, submit to him alone. Many different places of the Quran. Chapter 112, like uh, Amar has recited over here. So there is a continuity of the message from Adam all the way to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So, these are some of the prophets who are mentioned in the Quran by name. You have the biblical or the English names, then you have the Arabic names. For example, Prophet Aaron is Harun. Prophet uh, Yahya is John the Baptist. Jesus is called as Isa. Solomon, Suleiman, Dawood, David, Musa, Moses, right? So look at the commonality that Christianity and Judaism and Islam has. You know, people fight over superficial things. But if you look at Christianity, Islam and Judaism, 80% things are common. Right? 80% of the things are common. So Islam says in chapter number 3, uh, Quran says chapter number 3, verse number 64, that all people of the book, means our Jews and the Christians, come to a common term between you and us, that we worship none but one God, Allah. That we don't take any partners amongst ourselves with God. So Islam wants to bring unity despite our different nationalistic, religious, cultural, racial backgrounds. Right? So that is like the gist of the message of all the prophets of God. So Islam means submission to one God. It also means peace. Once we submit to God, peace would be the outcome. For example, when you are taking your class with uh, Dr. Johnson over here, there has to be certain guidance, rules and regulations that you give to, the, to your students, correct? Which they don't follow. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> like all of us. <laughs> now, suppose if he did not give you any rules or regulations in the class, what will happen to the class? Sometimes when the substitute teacher comes in, by the way, right? <laughs> you may be listening to your iPods, you may be browsing on the web, you may be doing so many things, but not paying attention to the curriculum that you are supposed to pay attention to. So there would be a chaos in the class. However, suppose if you are listening and you are supposed to listen to the to the professor and following the rules and regulations, the class would be more productive, more structured. Right? In the same way, peace would be the outcome if humanity and each single one of us listens and follows the commandments of God. So these are the important beliefs in Islam. The very first one being believing in the oneness of God. The second one is to believe in the angels that God has created. Right. So, can you name some of the angels from your own background? Michael. Michael. Gabriel. Gabriel. And many, many angels. The concept of angels in Islam is that angels are a creation of God. They're not sons and daughters of God. They're not mediators between us and God. Secondly, each single person has two angels with him or her. One on the right and one on the left. And they are writing down our deeds that we do. Hopefully the good deeds and hopefully not the bad deeds, right? But these angels, they are not like the guardian angel from uh, a wonderful life, all right? So these angels, they are just writing down the deeds and they would be presenting our deeds on the day of judgment. Then, important belief, we believe in all the prophets and messengers. We believe in all the divine books that God has sent to different prophets and messengers. To Prophet Abraham was given a book. To Prophet Moses and Jesus and David and to Muhammad, peace be upon him, the very last book. Islam says that the previous books that were given to the prophets, all of them, they got, some of them they got lost, some of them they got uh, altered, edited, revised and corrupted by human beings. So for that reason, God has sent his very last prophet with the very last book, which is the Quran. And in the Quran, God has mentioned that He Himself is going to protect the Quran from any corruption and from it getting edited. 
It says in chapter 15 and verse number 9 of the Quran that it is God, it is Allah who has revealed this reminder to the Quran. It is God who is going to protect it. So if we see the, the, the transmission and the protection of the Quran, you'll be amazed to find out that in the world today, there are close to 11 million Muslims who have memorized the whole book. 11 million Muslims. How many of you have memorized the textbook that the professor is teaching? Right? <laughs> About two pages from the book. Right? One page. <laughs> so that is the way. Even if a person destroys all the paper copies of the Quran, like Terry Jones. Right? Even if he destroys all the paper copies of the Quran, the CDs, DVDs from online, even then, Muslims could come together who have memorized the whole Quran and they could come and make the Quran, it will be exactly alike as this one. And it will be exactly alike like the way that was given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. These are the five pillars of Islam. The very first one is to profess with your mouth, with your tongue, without any compulsion, that I bear witness that there is no God besides one God, Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So if a person does that, that is how a person embraces the faith of Islam. So this is the recitation, this is called as the shahada, the witness. And each single year, despite the negative propaganda, 50,000 of our fellow Americans, they embrace the faith of Islam without any compulsion by anybody. Can you guess the names of some of these converts to Islam? Can, can you go back to the, the previous slide and just focus on, not the previous one, just focus on that because you've got only one minute. Sure, sure. Fine. <laughs> All right. By the way, they have something in the back there, right? Did they bring something or? No, they're Okay, fine. So okay. the five pillars of Islam. Yes, yeah, so the five pillars of Islam, right? Then we will wrap up the presentation. So the very first one is to declare the testimony of faith. The second one is to pray or worship five times a day. So the worship that you saw up there, that was the second worship of the day. The third one is to give charity to the poor. The concept of wealth in Islam is that anything that we have, my jacket, your iPods, your money, anything that you have, it is ultimately given by God as a responsibility to us. So God wants to test that are we going to share these things, our extra wealth that we have with our people who are less fortunate or are we going to just keep it to ourselves. So 2.5% of our wealth each single year, save for one year, we are supposed to give in charity to the poor, the needy and the homeless. Number four, number four up here is fasting. I have a prize for anyone who could name from our guest over here. What is the month of fasting called? The very first hand goes up. Ramadan. Uh, you didn't raise your hand. Ramadan. <laughs> okay. Ramadan, right? You could get the prize after you're done. <laughs> the month of Ramadan, right? The month of Ramadan, we have to fast about 29 to 30 days uh, of the year. And Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic 12 month lunar calendar. The fifth one is going to pilgrimage once in a lifetime to Mecca. Some of you were asking me before we started the presentation that if I were to the pilgrimage, yes, I was there last year, 2010. It was a profound feeling. Imagine the whole of Chicago coming together in one place. Four million people come there to Mecca from different countries and different nationalities and different races. They come there, they stand shoulder to shoulder, dressed in white clothes, and they worship the one creator. Person standing next to me, I would not know if he's a president of a certain country, or CEO of IBM, or the poorest person in the world. We are all equal in the eyes of God, and that's how Islam brings unity to humanity. So, to end with this, Malcolm X when he was growing up, he used to have very racist tendencies. Some of you may have seen the movie or read his book. But after he became a Muslim, then he went to Mecca. In Mecca, he interacted with the whitest of the white and the blackest of the black and all the shades in the middle. He prayed with them, he interacted with them, he ate with them. 
it had a profound change of his heart and mind and he wrote a letter to his friend in the US saying that if America also embraces Islam, all the racial problems of America also are going to vanish. So to some of my dear friends and my dear guests, Islam believes in absolute monotheism. Quran is the word of God that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him who is the last prophet and the last messenger. Jesus Christ, according to Islam, is a prophet and by believing and living and practicing the faith of Islam, the Quran says, chapter 2, verse number 25, if we have the right belief and do good deeds, God is going to guarantee paradise for individuals. So I hope and pray that may God guide each single one of us so we could have the best in this world and paradise in the hereafter. Thank you very much. Thank you.